Have you ever thought to yourself, there has to be more than this? Why does it seem like life has a way of making us feel less? Not just feel like less, but feel less, as in numb, leaving us to wonder if this is it. Is this all that life has for us? We spend every day just trying to make it from one item on our calendar to the next, from one email to the next, from one soul-crushing moment to the next. Was this God's plan? Is there more to life than this? What if God really does have more for us? More love, more joy, more peace, more purpose, more hope. What if God is the God of more? And what if the life we've been searching for is really found as we surrender our lives more and more to Jesus? Because Jesus is offering us a way to live life that is more than we've ever even dreamed of. We are Altitude Church. We are here to help you become more like Jesus. So, what are you becoming? Welcome to Altitude Church Online. My name is Lee Brown, and I'm the lead pastor of a new life-giving church that's launching this September in the Arvada portion of the Denver metro area. Altitude Church was born out of a vision to see our city, the Denver metro, transformed by the hope that can only be found in Jesus, one person at a time. As we prepare for the launch in September, we are going to have a number of launch events and we would love for you to be a part of them. You can keep track of all the events that are going on this summer 2021 by going to our website at altitude.church. You can also follow us on social on Instagram and Facebook and subscribe to the YouTube channel here to get notified about new updates as we bring them live. We are believing God and working hard to see 125 people get passionate about the mission and the movement that God is going to do in our city. If you feel even a nudge to be a part of launching a new life-giving church into the community, then I would encourage you to email us at launchteam at altitude.church. And I would love to to grab coffee with you or have a, a Zoom meeting and just talk to you about what it means to see our city transformed by hope. And of course, again, you can always connect through the interest parties and launch events that are gonna be happening throughout this summer. As we get into worship today, you're going to see a little bit of the Altitude Church vision along with a message that has been pre-recorded. I wanna make you aware that this isn't live. It's going to be from a different facility and and even a different uh, version of the church from what you're going to see as you encounter Altitude Church but the message is one that is still relevant to your life. And it still gives you a feel and a flavor for what I'm like and what the messages will be like as we launch Altitude Church together. We're so glad that you're joining us for worship today, and we encourage you to stay tuned for more information about all that God is doing throughout this process. Hello Church, I'm Kelly. I'm here today to share what our core values are here at Altitude Church. As we walk through this launch season, it's important to know not just where we are going, but who we are. Our core values reflect what is really important to us at Altitude Church. They give us a foundation of right and wrong, and they are the basis of our decisions, and they guide us into the future. These are modeled by our staff, our elders, and our leaders our core values are who we are. Here at Altitude Church, we have four core values. They are to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, make a difference. To know God is to become a committed follower of Jesus in every area of our life. We use words like Christ-centered and being a follower of Christ, not just a fan. What does that look like to know God? Spending time in God's Word, As Pastor Lee says, it's about letting the Bible go through us and living a life that is modeled after Jesus. Find freedom. It is to become a person of compassion, forgiveness, and acceptance through the love of Jesus. 
Here, we use words like acceptance, honesty, compassion, and forgiving. What does freedom look like? Being a part of a life group, or being a part of our First Impressions team, or maybe even working in our future cafe. Discover Purpose is to intentionally give of ourselves to help people become more like Jesus. For this, we use words like servant-hearted, having a passion to serve, getting things done, and being a person that Jesus created you to be. This can look like facilitating a life group, maybe being a part of our worship team and arts team, or this generation team, which is our kids and youth ministry, make a difference. It is to touch the lives of people in our community and beyond, sharing the hope of Jesus. Words that fit here would be being on mission or mission-hearted, generous, giving, focused on others. What does this look like? Working with our partners at Hope House, Beyond Home, and Save Our Youth. It might even look like going to another country and sharing the hope of Jesus around the world. The world we live in today does not put into practice good values. You won't find a lot of hope in the world. But as Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world.
Well, good morning, family. So glad to see everybody who's here and everybody who's online right now watching us who, you know, stayed inside for the snowstorm. So if you are here, if you're watching online, if you would share the live stream, it's going on on Facebook and now also on YouTube Live. And if you subscribe to YouTube, that helps out a bunch of things too to just get this message out into the community. But... This morning, as you may have noticed, we're starting a new series entitled The Absolute Joy of Being Unoffendable. And I don't know how to do a series about offending people without offending people. So, so I want to give a content warning right up front, right? You, you might not want to share the live stream until after we're done, just in case. And then you might want to share it like everywhere, or you, know, you might be really mad at me. Either way, I just want you to know that as we go through this, not just this message, but this whole series, I want to ask you to hold your thoughts until we've kind of talked through the big picture of everything. You see, in our culture... We have, uh, we've changed a few things in the last few years, haven't we? And, and one of the things I think we've changed is that the magic words used to be please and thank you. Like if you were on the playground and you wanted something, or if you're going to mom and dad, you went to them and said, please may I have and thank you. But the magic words have changed in society the magic words are now, I'm offended. That is like the way, it's the get out of jail free card, it's, you know, whatever. And so, I want to share a story of how I've misused those words. Have you ever done something that your spouse was standing near you and they went, stop it? And anybody's that got one of those? Well, okay, I, I've, I've done one of those. So, for me, it all comes down to cell phone plans. Stay with me for a moment. Cell phone plans. You see, six or seven years ago, when we were going in to get our new phones, I would say, here is my current iPhone. I want the new iPhone, please. And they were all really good with that. But then the cell phone companies started getting a lot bigger kickbacks from Android. And so I would go in and say, here's my iPhone. I want a new iPhone. And they'd say, you're an idiot. iPhones are for losers. You want the Android. And I would tell them, no, I don't. And we would go round and round for like half an hour. And then I would end up with my iPhone. But then a couple years ago, it got even worse. Because somehow, the cell phone companies bought the cable companies. And this ancient dinosaur of an industry called cable television suddenly became a part of my cell phone plan. And I would go in, I'd say, I want a new phone. And it wasn't Apple or Android anymore. It was like, great, which cable plan do you want? I don't want cable. Well, what do you watch television on? Netflix, like a normal human being. And they'd say, I'm sorry, you have to have cable. And I would say, I don't want cable. And so we'd go round and round, and eventually I would not have cable. And it just, it was a frustrating enterprise. Can I say that? But I figured out the secret. I would go in. Hi, how are you? I'm whoever, Dave. Welcome to your cell phone provider. I'd say, hi, Dave. Before we begin, I just want you to know, if I hear the words Android, cable, or satellite television, I will be personally offended. <laughs> and my wife's standing next to me. She goes, you're a pastor. Stop it. <laughs> Do you know how embarrassed I am right now? But it worked. They don't know how to respond to that. They just go, uh, so which phone do you want then? That one? Okay, let's just get the crazy guy out of my store, right? So the new magic words have changed. But I still feel this tension in society. I think we see it in every conversation, don't we? I, I wrote in your impact guide this, this line that I, I, you know, I hadn't really thought about. I just started writing. I was like, that's it. I said, every conversation feels like a hand grenade where the pin is already dropping to the ground. All of us are so offended and we're so offensive. So as we open up this series, the absolute joy of being unoffendable, we have a key tension that's going to kind of run throughout. 
And it's simply this. We can't control what other people are offended by, but we can choose to be unoffendable. We can't control what somebody on Facebook or on Twitter or on Snapchat or on TikTok or whatever the new social media of the day is, is offended by. We can't control what our spouse is offended by. I can do better to not embarrass her in public, but I can't control what she's offended by. I can't control what my best friend in the world is offended by. But I can personally choose to be unoffendable. And so that's what we're going to start with. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 6. Now we've been going through the gospel according to John for, for months now. And we're continuing to look at the life of Jesus. And can I just admit something? In our research, in our studies, as we've gone through this, you know, there's a lot of other pastors who've gone through the gospel according to John, and we sometimes look at where they break things down and where they, you know, use this verse or use that verse. About half of the resources we use skip this section. It's difficult. It's rough. So as you're turning in your Bibles, go to John chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 47, where we picked up last week. And over the last couple weeks, we remember Jesus just fed the 5,000, and then the crowds come and find them, and then now he's talking to them, and he says, truly, I tell you, anyone who believes has eternal life. Pause for a second. Let's look at that. Who doesn't like this, right? Anybody following Jesus is like, amen, like button on Facebook, heart on Twitter, wait, there we go, heart on Twitter, you know, whatever it is. But it's going to start to go a different direction here in a second. So the next verse, he says this. He says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. Now remember, last week as Ron was talking through that section, the the disciples and the, the Jewish leaders, they bring this idea to Jesus, right? He had just fed them. 5,000 to 10,000 to 15,000 people, he fed them, their stomachs are full, and they're like, hey, Jesus, by the way, did you know Moses? He gave us manna every day, right? And now Jesus is starting to turn things a little bit. He says, your ancestors ate that bread, and guess what it got them? They're dead. It's a little offensive starting out here. Then he says, this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. In other words, what what you're looking for over here, you're putting all your hope in this empty religion or whatever it is, I have what that was really pointing to. But here it gets really good. Go to the next verse here. He says in verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, all of a sudden, like, um, hold on, we were tracking with you there for a second. Did, did he just say what I think he said? And they're murmuring and they're having these little things over here. Because let's, let's talk about subtext here. The Jewish religious leaders had these laws against eating human flesh. Pretty decent law. I'm, I'm on board with that one, right? They had prohibitions about drinking blood. But Jesus says, the bread that comes down from heaven that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. He is being bold. He's using something called hyperbole. He's going above and beyond the point he's trying to make so that you realize how big a deal this really is. And all of a sudden, the crowds start looking and they're like, uh, wait a second, uh, go on to the next slide, I'm 52. Can, can this, this man... Give us his flesh to eat? I read one scholar who said, Jesus gave one of the greatest church services ever, had 15,000 people in attendance, and then the next day in one sermon, he drove everyone away. Right? He offended people. How can this man give us our flesh to eat? These people were there, as we talked about before, for the gift not the giver. They wanted manna. They wanted their tummies to stop rumbling. And Jesus is trying to point them to something deeper. But they won't 
get the point. They just keep going back to bread. Like, Jesus, it's cool that you're talking about all this other life stuff, but can we just have some food, please? It's not like they were starving, you know. They just wanted to be fed. They wanted the gift, not the giver. And so Jesus says, all right, if you're going to hear this, I'm going to have to say it a little bit louder. And he said some things that had the potential to offend some people. And Jesus said them on purpose. So I have some offendable thoughts for you this morning. This isn't the points that I'm making. These are just some thoughts as I'm rambling. But first and foremost, sometimes we need to be offended. If you're not offended, you don't believe in anything. If, if you're not offended, you're not ready to take a stand for something. Sometimes when we're offended, it makes us understand what we truly are all about. This crowd is offended. Jesus is pointing out to them what is truly on their hearts and minds. And the second thing, which again is kind of part of this key tension, the question that we have to wrestle with is not, will we be offended? But how will we handle the offense, because I guarantee you, in the outraged society that we live in, something offensive will be said right there, and right there, and right there. Don't be on Twitter while we're in here, but I bet, guarantee if you go on there, there's something. So not will we be offended, but how will we handle the offense? And so if you can believe this, um, last Sunday as I was thinking about this message, and throughout the week as I prepared, I, I tried getting on social media to find anything offensive. I tried watching the news. I, I, I tried all of the regular places. I, I even you know, tried to pick a fight in person. Nobody was offended about anything this last week. Do you believe that? There was nothing to be upset about politically. There was nothing to be upset about you know, in terms of how we interact with one another. They, I don't care what side of what fence you stand on, everybody got offended this week. Now, there was a very offensive thing that happened just last Sunday. Some of you know that there's this thing called foosball. And people play in the Super Bowl, Bowl something, right? And, and, you know, I'm not a sports ball guy. And so I didn't watch the Super Bowl. I used to watch it for the commercials, but now I'm offended. Thank you. I used to watch it for the commercials, but now they're available online like a week in advance. And if they're not online a week in advance, they're at least online the second they air. And so it wasn't a big deal. I just didn't even think about it. But then I got on social media after the Super Bowl. And guess what I saw? I'm offended. People were offended by the halftime show. They were offended that there were these two singers, some called them more aged singers, which offended some other people, who were playing, and then, and then they were doing some things, and, you know, again, I didn't watch it, but, but one of my friends I was talking to this week said his kids were watching it with him, and they just turned around and said, Daddy, why are there so many butts on TV right now? What is going on? But here's what really got me. Because people were offended by the Super Bowl halftime show, but then it went another direction. And I started seeing, I, I covered their faces, go to the next slide, uh, I covered their faces, but these are actual friends of mine on Facebook. And so I, I started seeing people who were offended that people were offended at the halftime show. And you, you can't read it from here, but that's okay. You can see like this wall of words, angry, how dare you, you know, you're shaming women and, and we should be able to show our bodies. And I had one of my buddies, he's like, hello, I watch professional wrestling. Men dance around in their underwear every Monday night, you'll be okay. You know, so, so people are offended. People are offended that people are offended, but wait, there's more. <laughs> because then I started seeing, go to the next slide, people were offended that people were offended, that people were offended. It was like this inception level thing where the offenses just kept going deeper and deeper and you had this side, it's like a ping pong match, right? Like, ba ping, ba ping. You don't know where it's gonna land or who's gonna score a point, but everybody's mad at everybody else and it's over a Super Bowl game halftime show. 
That's where we are as a society, right? We're offended. We're offended that you're offended. And I'm offended that you're offended that she's offended. Everybody's offended. But as you can understand, Jesus kind of went a different way with things. Jesus offended when it mattered. He spoke truth even if it offended people. But Jesus was also different. Like when people tried to trap him into one position or another, you know, should we give taxes to Caesar? He didn't land on the yay government or no dumb government side of things. He went this third alternate way that was unexpected. When people, you know, brought to him this woman who's caught in adultery, he he didn't land on this, hey, she's a sinner, everybody grab a rock, let's go. And he also didn't land on this side over here. It was like, it doesn't matter, guys. God will get over it. He went this unexpected third direction. And I think Jesus is calling us to go an unexpected and different direction in this offense war that we have going on in society. And so I'm going to put a, a verse on screen here. Look at Proverbs 19:11. I called this the ancient tool that has the ability to save your modern day relationships. This ancient tool in Proverbs that Jesus would have known. He he would have had it memorized. The disciples would have memorized it. But can we actually live it? It says this. A person's insight gives him patience. And it is his virtue to overlook an offense. A person's insight gives them patience. I call that having a softer heart. We're going to talk about that in two weeks. But his virtue allows him to overlook an offense. I call that having a thicker skin. So this ancient practice that we're going to be unpacking over the next few weeks is having a thicker skin and a softer heart. If you have your impact guide, it's going to, we're going to draw a little bit here. So turn to page 12, your sermon notes. Or if you have your, uh, don't have the impact guide, you've got a bulletin there. You've got some blank space. And we're going to do a little drawing here for a moment because this is going to help us to bring this home, right? So what I want you to do is draw a square and then put a plus sign or a cross in the middle of it. So it creates these four distinct boxes. We call these quadrants in, in you know, some of the sociological study stuff they do. And on this side of it, you're going to write thin and thick. That's your skin. Thin-skinned, thick-skinned. And on the top, you're going to write hard and soft, and that's the condition of your heart. So let's look at how we can react as a society to whatever offends us. The first quadrant is hard-hearted and thin-skinned. Nobody knows anybody like this, right? Nobody on social media Nobody posts the angry face on Facebook to everything somebody else does, right? Nobody comes on and and writes these incendiary remarks to anything. I call this person the rager. If you are hard-hearted and thin-skinned, you're on rage about everything. Everything offends you, and you're ready to explode, Some people might call these trolls online or or whatever. You know, it's a response, not a person, though. It's it's a response of rage. And then you have soft-hearted person who's also thin-skinned. And so the the heart is going in the right direction, but the skin is really thin. And so everything gets through the skin and pierces the heart. Everything makes it through our skin and wounds us. I call this... The martyr response. The martyr response. Your heart is pure, but everything hurts. You don't hear a lot from this person on social media because the rager attacks them and they're like, I'm out, I'm done, right? Then there's hard-hearted and thick-skinned. I am a card-carrying member of this category, although I'm trying to move myself over. I call this the tank. Because your skin, it's like Superman. It's steel, right? Whatever comes at you, it just bounces off. It's not getting through. But the heart condition, the heart condition is also hard. And so while your skin is tough, 
Your heart's like leather. You're not offended by a whole lot, but nothing stirs your heart either. You're not moving towards anything. You're just, you're a tank. You're sitting there going, I'm good. Nothing's getting to me. So if those are the usual responses to offense, what is it that Jesus is calling us to? Proverbs 19, 11 is this, softer heart, thicker skin. Softer heart, but thicker skin. I call this being unoffendable. It's not a word. Every time I put it on screen or in my notes, it, you know, Microsoft underlines it and is like, hey, stop using this. It's not a real word. But it's going to be a word for us, right? It's unoffendable. A softer heart means that you are moved by things. You are moved by people. You, you, you try to understand where someone's coming from before you jump on the angry face button on Facebook. But thicker skin means that when somebody says something, rather than taking personal offense and attacking and fighting back and playing ping pong, you say, you know what? Hey, that, that rolls off. And when you're softer hearted, and you're understanding where people are coming from and maybe some of the reasons why they are being so angry or they are being so mean, but you also don't take personal offense to it, that's that Jesus path. That's where things start to, to roll off and you start to feel better about yourself and more loving towards the person. So in this text, as I said, Jesus lost an entire crowd with one sermon. Because that crowd was somewhere in here. That crowd was upset that Jesus would say what he said. And, and we don't really get that. I, I, I mean, we get offended. But this crowd would have been deeply offended. So I'm going to talk about something deeply offensive. Remember, I want you to hold your thoughts until we go through it. Because we're walking through this process. We're walking through these quadrants. You see, there was one more thing from the Super Bowl that upset some people. Surprise. Right? You just want to play football, but everybody gets mad. Actually, it wasn't what was at the Super Bowl. It was what was not allowed to be a part of the Super Bowl. There was a commercial that was in debate, that, that was... Supposed to be aired, some would say. I mean, last July, the people who were getting this commercial ready, uh, they, they had put everything in that they needed to. They met all the deadlines, all the financial requirements and stuff. But, but, but the commercial had the, the potential to offend people. And so from what I can understand from the account, Fox kind of didn't say no, didn't say yes. They just kept saying, this is under review, this is under review. And then the schedule filled up, and again, didn't say no, didn't say yes. They just said, oh, you know what? We don't have room for this commercial. Sorry about that, guys. Try again next year. The commercial is called Faces of Choice. It shows people, adults, children, who survived abortion attempts. It showed people who were weeping and were emotional and we're sharing their story. And it's offensive. So offensive that Fox didn't want to air it. And yet, this topic is going around in Colorado right now. In fact, I've heard more about this topic in the last couple weeks than I had for, for months and months and years even combined. Because there's some, some action that's being taken. Uh, some groups are trying to, to get where uh, late-term abortion is uh, going to be on a ballot through a petition, gathering signatures and helping people to say, you know, we stand against late-term abortion. And yet, as, as people hear that, they, they, they hear Jesus people talking about this, where do their minds go? They go to the people who have thrown plastic babies at abortion clinics or, or, or thrown blood onto people as they walked by and yelled and screamed at them. That, that's not the Jesus response. That's the rage response. Or, or, or you hear people who, you know, are, are wounded, so hurt, but everything is so 
personally charged that they don't know how to lead someone towards truth. They just are angry and broken. And then you've got the tanks who just say, whatever, doesn't affect me, I'm good, right? So what would Jesus' response be to an offensive topic like that? Jesus stands for the unborn. It says in the Psalms that he knit us together in our mother's womb, that he knows the days that have numbered for us before we've even lived one. And some people are going, hooray, and others are going, how dare. But here's the thing, Jesus stands for the woman who feels like she's trapped Feels like she doesn't have an option. Feels like she doesn't know where to go. Feels like whatever has happened to her or is happening in her, it it was something that was either forced on her or something that is forcing her. And some would look and say, oh, how dare you? We cast you aside. Jesus stands with her too. Jesus stands with the woman who's had an abortion. People I've talked to who celebrate isn't the right word, but recognize the day that that child would have been born. And every year feels like another wound to the heart. But they made the decision they felt that they needed to make for whatever reason the circumstances were about. And and these are people who are are hurting, who, who don't know where to go and aren't going to turn to the church because our response has mostly been, how dare you, you stupid sinner. Right? Jesus also stands with the born, children in our city right now who don't have enough food to eat. As we talked to the school that was over closer by Sloan's, the the same one that we did our blessing for, Colfax Elementary, I was told by, in no uncertain terms, that there are certain children that on snow days don't eat. They get food when they come to school, and that's it. Jesus stands for people and see when we get offended all we want to talk about is what we're against all we want to talk about is who the enemy is not realizing that Jesus is for us as human beings he is for the person who is struggling he is for the person who feels abandoned he is for the elderly who who feel like they have no one left he is for us I want to share with you that we have some resources that are going to be available in the the gathering room. Not the lobby. The lobby is this first little entry place right here. The gathering room is the down the hallway in there. Uh, Denya is going to be there, and and she works with a company that has resources. If, If you want to know more about this petition, you can talk to her. If you want to know more about resources for mothers who are struggling with this decision or you know somebody who doesn't feel they can go to their parents or doesn't feel like they can go to their friends, we have resources available through that. If, if you know somebody who, who has had an abortion or who's going through a struggle with that and needs aftercare, there are resources. If you know somebody who, whose kids aren't going to eat if they don't go to school, there are resources for that. You see, on this topic of being offended, when we get offended, we often turn to either inaction or improper action, don't we? We get mad at people, we get mad at positions, and we forget that, but for the grace of God, there go I. I told you it was going to be offensive, right? Some of you stopped nodding a little while ago, and that's, that's okay. But if we're going to be unoffendable, We need to be willing to have conversations with real people that God really loves, who are really going through hurt and pain, that might really say something that irks us and say, you know what, I'm going to let that slide off because I see with my heart that you are hurting, that you need Jesus, that you need care, and I will be there for you. Because the other thing being offended does is it allows us to wash our hands, doesn't it? I'm offended I'm walking away. It's easier. I'm going to say some offensive things. It's easier to be offended because it doesn't require as much from us. But when we allow that offense to roll off and see the person behind it, it might cause us to go to someone who deeply hurt us and say, you know what? 
I don't know what you're going through there, but when you're done yelling at me, I'm still going to be there for you. I, I don't know what you're dealing with, but I forgive you for that. I, I don't know if you need that, but I feel like I need to say it. Because when we are unoffendable, it causes us to dig in and to see people, not see positions. To see people and see their hearts, not see the weight of their sin. Because the reality is, if we're judging people by the weight of our sin, the, the things that break us, well, Jesus said, he who is without, sto- uh, without sin cast the first stones. Not saying we can't stand for truth. We should. We should stand for the unborn. We should stand for the woman who's had a, an abortion. We should stand for the born that need help. We should stand for truth. But the way we do it is by having thicker skin and a softer heart. Turn back to John chapter 6. Look at the response that Jesus' people give. Go on to the next slide. It says, therefore, when many of his disciples, circle that word, heard this, they said, this teaching is hard. Who can accept this? And Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were complaining about this, asked them, does this offend you? That was unplanned, but good timing. Can we, can we cut that out, though? Does this? <laughs> that was the best thing that could have happened right there. I'm just saying, like, woo, cut the tension with a knife. So in this section... Apparently we're picking up radio stations now. Awesome. In this section of my Bible, this is called Many Disciples Abandon Jesus. So even Jesus lost people over standing for truth with a tender heart and a thick skin. Think about what it means to be Jesus. I know that's a weird statement. We often talk about the Last Supper. We're heading towards Easter. Nine weeks away, we're going to talk about Jesus going to the cross. But think about that night before. Jesus sat down and had dinner with two men who betrayed him. One of them, Judas, was betraying him to his death. And he sat and had dinner with him, knowing what Judas was doing. The second one, Peter, was about to betray him on a little bit lesser level, but to the same degree, like, when Peter said, you know, I, I don't know this man. Like, aren't you with the Galilean? And he cusses at them. Like, I don't know this man. Like, that's a pretty harsh betrayal, too. And Jesus not only sat with them, he washed their feet. He bowed down, humbled himself before them, brought their stinky, filthy foot up. This isn't like modern day feet where you might have a little toe jam and fungus. This was I walk on dirt roads that animals relieve themselves on and we don't really have the best shoe technology at the time kind of things. And Jesus took that stinky foot and he washed it. If Judas, I'm sorry, if Jesus can wash Judas's foot while he's betraying him, we can stand with people that offend us and learn to love them. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he laid out bread and wine. Some people say grape juice. Either way, we're not going to get offended. <laughs> he laid out these elements and he said, this is my body. Right back to this same text. This is my body. It's the bread of life and it is broken for you. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And, and then he took a cup and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. For you. Ten disciples who weren't doing anything too terrible at the moment took that. And two that were about to fall on their face pretty hard did too. Thanks again for joining us today in worship at Altitude Church Online. As we mentioned at the start, we're about to enter into a different season. Phase two of the launch of Altitude Church. As we prepare to launch as a new life-giving church on September 19th of this year, we are going to see some interest parties, some generosity events, and some pop-ups that just happen at random. So to find out more information about those and to keep up to date on what's going on, 
Be sure to keep checking out altitude.church and follow us on social, on Instagram, Facebook, subscribe to the YouTube channel, all of those wonderful things so that we can stay in contact with you and let you know about the amazing things God's doing as we prepare for this launch. Also, if you feel even a nudge towards helping launch a new ministry that wants to be an epicenter of hope to our community, I would encourage you to contact us at launchteam at altitude.church because we're working hard and believing God to see 125 people come together as a movement into this city. We'd love to equip, train, and help you discover your passion and purpose in the midst of that. Also, if you'd like to support the ministry financially, you can do so safely and securely online anytime at altitude.church as you see the link on the screen below. These next few weeks are going to look a little bit different, but that's okay. We're going to walk them together. And so we invite you to stay tuned for all of the amazing events that are going to be happening and check back right here, same time, same YouTube channel next week. We'll see you then.